valence bond theory and hybridization. That is the topic of interest in this next lesson uh, in my new organic chemistry playlist. So in this first chapter, just a review of general chemistry and as just a reminder of where we've come from and where we're headed, uh, we just did lessons on Lewis structures uh, and formal charges. We'll now hit valence bond theory and hybridization, which will feed nicely into the next lesson on molecular orbital theory. And then finally, we'll finish this chapter off with a lesson on polarity and a lesson on intermolecular forces. All right, so valence bond theory. So at the heart of valence bond theory, it just talks about what creates a covalent bond. So we like to talk about the sharing of electrons and stuff. So, but this takes a step further and says that atomic orbitals are actually gonna overlap and that's where the electrons are gonna be shared. So that's kind of at the heart of it. So we gotta remind ourselves what these atomic orbitals look like. And wanna look at, first of all, your 1s orbital and it's just a nice spherical orbital. So a nice solid sphere, uh, like a bowling ball, not a basketball, so it's solid. So, and it just gives you an idea of where you can find an electron around the nucleus. So the nucleus is at the center of that sphere so, and somewhere in that sphere, at least to the 95% probability is what we're usually mapping. Uh, that's what the actual three-dimensional equation would look like. And again, we call those wave functions. Now for a 2p orbital, so these we say are dumbbell shaped and there is a, what we call a node at the nucleus. And a node is just a place where the function goes to zero. Now you probably remember uh, your sine function and your cosine function, and they also had nodes. So for the sine function, they have nodes at all the multiples of pi. It's just where the function has a value of zero. Now your sine function, your cosine function, these were two-dimensional wave equations, but here we now have three dimensional wave equations that describe something related to where you find an electron in an atom. So cool, now this is the 1s and the 2p. If you actually worked your way higher to like the 2s or the 3p and higher orders, what you find out is one, they're bigger, but they also start having these radial nodes, areas uh, at a set radius around the nucleus where you also won't find an electron. So, but I'm gonna leave those out of the discussion. I really just wanna focus here, but the big thing, take away from those is that as you go to higher orders of S and P orbitals, higher shells, if you will, uh, they're larger and they end up forming longer bonds, which are typically weaker bonds and things of this sort. All right, one last thing to talk about with these wave functions. So uh, just like a sine function can be both positive and negative, and notice from zero to pi, your sine function is positive, and from pi to two pi, your sine function takes on negative values. And every time you cross from positive to negative, you gotta cross through zero, and that's your node. And so same thing here, if we look at that p orbital right at the nucleus, whether it be the, the p orbital on the y-axis, the x-axis, or the z-axis, that's the difference in those three p orbitals. So they all have a node right at the nucleus. And the reason they have that node is that your function is going from positive to negative and it might be positive on top and negative on bottom or vice versa it's totally arbitrary for this lovely p orbital on the y-axis and so sometimes instead of showing plus and minus and again this is not charge this is the mathematical sign just the values of the function itself so in this case and sometimes instead of actually showing the plus and minus sometimes what we do is actually do a difference in shading we'll shade one side and not shade the other or shade one side blue and shade the other side green or something along these lines so here i'm just using one side shading and one side not shading and it's not like one means plus and the other means minus but one of them does mean plus and the other minus it's just arbitrary which is which so this just shows you that there's two different signs for the different sides of this wave function and then again that node right at the nucleus cool so again, at the heart of valence bond theory is overlapping orbitals to create these covalent bonds. Now, if we take a look at a very simple molecule to start off with, and we'll just start off with a molecule of elemental hydrogen here, H2. So that lovely line represents a covalent bond. And what we actually really have going on is so hydrogen's got its unpaired electron, its only electron in an S orbital. And those S orbitals are gonna to come together and overlap according to valence bond theory. And that's where in these overlapping orbitals, that's where the electrons are going to live that are being shared here. The ones described by that lovely line there representing the covalent bond. So and it turns out we would call this a sigma overlap. So we'll get exactly what that means here in a second. Uh, so often it's not gonna be easy to identify what it means until you see something that's not an example. We'll see pi overlap here in a little bit. Uh, if we compare this to say HF. So hydrogen again has an S orbital here so that it's one S electron, it's only electrons involved in. So, but fluorine, his valence electrons are in the 2S and the 2P. So, and in this case his unpaired electron. So valence bond theory talks about atoms using their unpaired electrons. Those are the ones they share. Well, for fluorine, it's unpaired electron is in one of these 2p orbitals. And so fluorine here is going to, 
overlap. It's 2p orbital with hydrogen's 1s orbital. I've probably drawn the 1s a little big or the 2p a little small, truth be told, but uh, you get the idea. And again, in these overlapping orbitals, that's where our lovely two shared electrons are going to live. That again is valence bond theory. And again, this is also described as sigma overlap. Now, if I take a and highlight in blue where the nuclei are in both cases here, what you find is that we say that the overlap occurs along this internuclear axis. That's our technical term. And it's just the line connecting the two nuclei. And as long as your orbital overlap is occurring somewhere on that line, that is sigma overlap. And it turns out they give it the, the letter sigma here. That's the Greek letter sigma, which corresponds to our English letter S. And it's because all single bonds are sigma bonds, as we'll find out in a little bit. Cool. Let's look at one more example of this. And maybe if we look at a molecule of F2. So in this case, both of them have their unpaired electrons in S orbitals. And so your S orbitals are overlapped sideways here. And once again, that overlap is occurring along this internuclear axis. And so once again, we will refer to this as being sigma overlap. Cool. Now, pi overlap is the only other type that we'll talk about in this course. There's sigma and there's pi, and that's it. And so pi is nice. So for a sigma overlap, you can use any kind of orbital. So you can use s's, you can use an s and a p, you can use a p and a p. You can also use these hybrid orbitals that I'll reference a little bit later, but we have sp, sp2, and I didn't write it down here, sp three hybrid orbitals. Those can also be used in, in sigma overlap as well, but pi overlap is specific and pi Greek letter P, essentially, so it corresponds to our English letter P, and you can only use P orbitals for pi overlap. But we used P orbitals here, and that was still sigma overlap, so it's, the key is it's not end-to-end -end overlap. It's not overlap that's going to take place on this internuclear axis. It turns out it's going to be pi overlap is going to be when it occurs side to side. Let's do it where we got a little more room here. So if we got two atoms next to each other, so again, here's our nuclei. So, but the overlap doesn't occur along this internuclear line. The overlap's occurring above and below that internuclear axis. And so that is what we refer to as pi overlap. Cool. And the only orbitals allowed to be involved are p orbitals. And they overlap side to side, not end to end, we say. So in summary, the end to end overlap of any two orbitals, that's going to be sig sigma overlap. But the side to side overlap of p orbitals and only p orbitals, that is our pi overlap. And we'll find out we're only going to have pi bonds with double and triple bonds. So it turns out uh, when you start making multiple bonds, it turns out you're only going to have one set of orbitals that actually point towards each other along this internuclear axis. So just like here, here, here. And so you can only make one sigma bond, and that's the first one any two atoms always makes. But if you're going to make any additional bonds, then it can't be along this internuclear axis where you're already making a sigma bond. Any additional ones are going to have to be sideways overlap of p orbitals. So a, a double bond would be one sigma and one pi, a triple bond would be one sigma and two pi bonds. All right, so now I want to take a little bit deeper look at hybridization. And so first off, I just want to point out that you can just look at a Lewis structure and determine an atom's hybridization without even understanding what hybridization is. So I want to point that out first, because you definitely have to be able to quickly determine hybridization. And the truth is you don't really need to even understand hybridization to pull that off. Now you will have to have a little bit better understanding of hybridization, and we will get into that in a little bit. So, but it turns out there's a simple relationship between the number of electron domains around an atom and its corresponding hybridization, as well as its bond angles. And we related this back to like Vesper theory in gen chem and things of this sort. And we said that, so, the farthest apart you could put two things is 180 degrees. And so valent shell electron pair repulsion Vesper theory says the electron domains around an atom want to spread out as far as possible. And for two things, that's 180 degrees. For three things, it was going to be 120 degrees. So that corresponds to a trigonal planar shape, whereas the 180 was linear. And then finally, for four things, it spreads out into a three-dimensional shape. Instead of being 90 degrees apart, in three dimensions, they can spread out a little further to 109.5 degrees apart in a tetrahedral shape. And you can also relate this to corresponding hybridizations. Now, again, we'll get into what those mean a little bit in uh, a little bit later uh, and give you a little bit better understanding. So, but if we look at this, uh, we first got to talk about what is an electron domain. An electron domain is one of two things. It's either an atom 
that you're bonded to, and I say you, an atom that another atom is bonded to, or it's a non-bonding pair of electrons. That's it. And when we say an atom that an atom is bonded to, it doesn't matter if it's a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond, that is still just an electron domain. So for example, this carbon right here is bonded to four different atoms directly and has no lone pairs. That's a total of four electron domains. Its hybridization will be described as sp3, and its bond angles would be 109.5. Okay, so we'll move on to nitrogen right here. So nitrogen here's got three atoms it's bonded to and one lone pair, also for a total of four electron domains. So the nitrogen we'd say is sp3 hybridized and its bond angles are roughly 109.5. Now the truth is though, so with this 109.5, it turns out that the lone pair gives greater repulsion to the electrons in this bonds than they do to each other. And so they get scrunched down a little bit and you should know that that occurs. And so the bond angles here, the angles between the actual bonds, instead of being 109.5 exactly, is just a teeny bit less. It turns out right around 107 degrees in the case of ammonia. And you wouldn't be responsible for knowing that it's 107, but you should know that instead of being exactly 109.5, it is just slightly lower than 109.5. Cool, look at the next example here. This is formaldehyde. And in this case, the carbon is bonded to three atoms. It doesn't matter if this is a double bond, we're just gonna count that as one electron domain. So one, two, three electron domains total because there's no lone pairs around the carbon. And with three electron domains, we'd say that that carbon is sp2 hybridized and that the bond angles around it are gonna be 120 degrees. Now, here's another place where the bond angles won't be exactly the number listed here because this double bond has greater electron density than these single bonds. And so there's gonna be a greater repulsion. And so the angle between the double and the single actually slightly bigger than 120 on both sides. And that forces this which gets scrunched down just a little bit to be a little bit smaller than 120 degrees. Now we could say again that the bond angles are approximately 120 and that's a true statement, but they're not exactly in this case as well because one of the electron domains was a double bond whereas the others were singles. Cool, we could also look at it from auction's perspective. Auction is bonded to one atom and has two lone pairs. Also for a total of three electron domains, the auction's sp2 hybridized and the bond angles, if it had multiple bonds in this case, would be 120. Well, in this case, it doesn't actually have multiple bonds, but the angle you could say between the lone pairs is 120 or between the lone pair and the double bond would be 120, but that technically wouldn't be a bond angle, but it would be roughly 120. Finally, on this last one, we could look at a few different atoms. We could look at the carbon on the left, which is bonded to four different atoms and is sp3 hybridized 109.5. We could look at this carbon right here, which is bonded to two atoms and is sp hybridized and bond angles of 180. And then we can look at the nitrogen, which is bonded to one atom and has one lone pair, also sp hybridized. Cool, that's how you can identify an atom's hybridization simply by looking at it and counting the number of electron domains. We'll see where this comes from in a little bit. Okay, so I wanna take a little closer look at methane here to kind of get the idea of where this you know, idea of hybridization even comes from. So in this case, we see that carbon is bonded to four different hydrogens. So, and for bonding theories, I'll explain that it's the valence electrons that are used in bonding. So if we take a look at carbon's electron configuration, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. And if we kind of show that in diagram form here, we're gonna focus on the 2s and 2p electrons because those are the valence. So we've got two electrons in the 2s orbital, and then we've got two unpaired electrons in two different 2p orbitals. Now, classic bond theory say that it's the unpaired electrons that are used in bonding. And so we look at this and say, well, carbon's only got two unpaired electrons. Therefore, carbon should only be able to make two bonds, but we know that carbon makes four bonds. So there's problem number one. So, and there's an easy solution to this problem. Carbon's gonna promote one of the 2s electrons and put it up into a p orbital. And we call this a promotion. Cool. The result is that carbon now has four unpaired electrons and now can make four bonds. So when electrons are shared in a bond, that lowers their energy and makes them significantly more stable. And so you might be like, well, Chad, why would this electron go to a higher energy orbital? Well, it looks like that's really just gonna be an investment because now by making two additional bonds, there will be a significant lowering, significant re reduction in the energy of the electrons, so in the molecule, and therefore it'll be a much more stable arrangement. So, which is kind of the idea of why atoms make bonds to begin with. But we still have a problem here. So we've still got an electron in a 2s orbital and then three in the 2p orbitals. And if you recall, those 2p orbitals are ones on the x-axis, ones on the y-axis, ones on the z-axis. And if you recall, valence bond theory says that orbitals are overlapping to make these bonds. Well, hydrogen's a valence electron. It's only electrons in the 1s orbital. We know what he's gonna be using to overlap in all four of these cases. The question is, what's carbon gonna be using? Well. If we think this is what carbon's using, we're gonna have a, an immediate problem here. So let's say we got carbon here. 
with one of his P orbitals right there. And let's just say on top, that's where it overlaps with the S orbital of hydrogen. Cool. And let's say that's PY. Now we take a look at, say, PX. And PX on the X axis overlaps with the S orbital of another hydrogen. And the problem is, is that the Y axis and the X axis are only 90 degrees apart. And that makes it appear as if the bond angles should end up being 90 degrees, except we know that they're not. We can look at a molecule of methane and actually measure the bond angles from electron density maps and stuff, and we know they're 109.5 degrees. And so what we figured out is that, you know, carbon's not actually using his S and P orbitals to make his bonds. What carbon is actually doing is combining these orbitals to make new ones. And so it turns out carbon is gonna take and combine all of these four orbitals. So it turns out, again, these orbitals are just math equations. They're wave functions. And when you start combining math equations, well, you guys have combined math equations before. So we're doing something similar here. It's not quite so simple as that, but it's along those lines. But the number of wave functions you combine is the number of different ways they can be combined as well. So in this case, I'm going to combine an S and all three of the Ps. I'm combining four orbitals. It creates four brand new wave functions, four brand new orbitals. And since they're combinations of both S's and P's, we'll call them hybrid atomic orbitals. And so in this case, they're going to be a little lower in energy than P orbitals, but a little higher energy than the S orbital since it's a combination of the two. And we don't get crafty on the name. They're just based on what they're built from. Built from an S and three Ps, call them SP3s. So if you're SP3 hybridized, you've mixed an S and three P orbitals, four orbitals total, you're always going to have four of these hybrid orbitals. And these still all have an unpaired electron. So life is good. And now we just look at what do these actually look like? If we actually combine the mathematical wave functions, those equations in four different ways, we call it linear combination of atomic orbitals if you care. So if you actually map them out, so what you end up with is you got carbon and then you get this long kind of funky kind of orbital that looks kind of like a P orbital, but kind of like with an extended S orbital. And it's, it's a little bit strange, but it's a combination of three Ps and a single S orbital to make this and it can overlap with the S orbital of hydrogen. Then you get another one that would point down over here, down at an angle, and it turns out this angle right here is going to be 109.5 degrees. Turns out exactly what we see in the molecule. It's not 90, it really is 109.5 degrees. And the hybrid orbitals that we can create by linear combination of atomic orbitals are exactly 109.5 degrees apart. Now, it's going to be difficult for me to draw the other two of these orbitals. I've driven, you know, drawn two of them. To draw the other two would be a challenge because it's a three-dimensional shape. One of them would be coming out of the board. One of them would be going back into the board. So, but it would be a much better drawing if I could, but I've only driven, you know, only drawn driven. Where we're getting that. Only drawn half the drawing here. So, Cool, but you get the idea is that now this actually is a better reflection of what we see in reality for the actual molecule of methane than trying to use the original just plain old S and P orbitals. Cool. Now it turns out that the truth is though, this is kind of a lie as well. It actually is even more complicated than this. And we talk about molecular orbital theory in the next chapter. It turns out that this idea of hybridization and stuff like that, it's not really a perfect reflection of the truth either. But we'll get closer to that in molecular orbital theory in the next lesson. So now I'm going to take a little more thorough look at hybridization. We'll look at it from the perspective of carbon, being that this is organic chemistry, but this happens with other elements as well. And again, carbon has four valence electrons, only two that are unpaired. It promotes one so that it now has four unpaired electrons. But we see if we use these regular atomic orbitals, we don't get the right geometries that correspond to reality. And that's, again, the idea behind why hybridization uh, why that theory kind of took hold and why we suggest that it occurs. Now, uh, we got really three different options for carbon in this case. He can mix his S and all three Ps and make four sp3 hybrids. That's one option. And if you have four electron domains, that's exactly what you want to do because those sp3s all point 109.5 degrees apart. Now, your other option is to only combine an S with two of the Ps. And if you combine an S with two Ps, one S, two Ps, you're only combining three orbitals. You only make three hybrid orbitals, and we call them sp2 hybrids, just based on what they're, you know, what they're composed of. But that leaves you with an unhybridized P orbital, that last P orbital, not part of the hybridization process at all, left behind, still unhybridized. Cool, and that's perfectly the case. These sp2 hybrids, it turns out, point magically 120 degrees apart. So, but the p orbitals left behind that electron right there because that's what you'll need to make a pi bond. So keep in mind in this kind of a structure where carbon's got one double bond and two single bonds, 
all single bonds are sigma bonds. So and when you've got a double or triple bond, the first one is also a sigma, but any additional bonds past that point are going to be pi bonds. And so you can see that the hybrid orbitals are going to be used to make all the sigma bonds, but it is an unhybridized p orbital that is needed to make pi bonds. Keep in mind again that a pi bond is always the sideways overlap of plain old p orbitals. Nothing else can be involved in a pi bond. That's why we had to have a p orbital left over to make that pi bond. Cool. Now the last option is if we just mix one s and one p orbital. So if you mix a single s and a single p, you're only mixing two orbitals. You only create two hybrids. We call them sp hybrid orbitals. They magically point 180 degrees apart. So and that leaves you with the last two p orbitals still in existence and they're used to make pi bonds. And so when you see a carbon having a single bond and a triple bond, again, the single bond is a sigma bond and the first bond of the triple bond is a sigma bond as well. But the other two bonds are both pi bonds. And that's why we needed these two different p orbitals, one for making each of those pi bonds. This also happens, it turns out, much less commonly, but if carbon's got two double bonds. So the first bond on either double bond is a sigma bond, but the additional bonds are also pi bonds. But having a triple bond would be a much more common occurrence that you'll see throughout the course. Cool, but these are the kind of three results for carbon and it just magically works out that with sp3 hybrid orbitals, they're all 109.5 apart. That with sp2 hybrid orbitals, they're always 120 apart. And with sp hybrid orbitals, they're 180 degrees apart. So explaining, you know, how this matches up with what we know from Vesper theory and how molecules really look. All right, so we want to visit these molecules we had on the board just a second ago. And if you're looking at the, the, the study guide, they're in that as well. So we'll look at them one more time and talk about a common question you're going to see in an organic chemistry exam. And so what they might do in light of everything we've just presented now is talk about what orbitals are overlapping in any given bond or what orbital is a particular lone pair of electrons in. So now first thing I want to do is go back and just, you know, designate hybridizations for all these lovely atoms here. And so in this case, carbon right here is sp three hybridized, having four electron domains. Nitrogen here is also sp3 hybridized, having four electron domains. Carbon here is just sp2 hybridized. Oxygen was as well, both having only three electron domains. So the carbon on the left here is sp3 hybridized. So carbon on the right is sp hybridized, having just two domains, and then nitrogen also sp hybridized, having just two domains. Now, the way this works, if an atom is hybridized, it will always use hybrid orbitals to make its sigma bonds. It will also put lone pairs in those hybrid orbitals as well. So if we take a look here, so carbon here, in this case has four sigma bonds, one there, one there, one there, and one there. And he's gonna use an sp3 hybrid orbital for his half of all four of those. Now, hydrogen, on the other hand, is not hybridized at all. He's just got that one unpaired electron, only gonna make one bond, and when that's the case, he just uses the plain old regular atomic orbital, not the hybrid atomic orbital. And for hydrogen, that's just a one S orbital. So if the question said, hey, for that bond right there, what orbitals are overlapping to create it? Well, carbon, you'd look at and say, well, he's sp3 hybridized, and that's a sigma bond, so he's gonna use one of his sp3 hybrids. And hydrogen is just gonna use an s orbital, and those are the orbitals that are overlapping to create that sigma bond. Cool, if we take this a little further, we could also point at any one of these nitrogen-hydrogen bonds, and you should be like, okay, nitrogen's hybridized. So since that also is a sigma bond, the nitrogen being hybridized is going to use one of his sp3 hybrid orbitals. And hydrogen, once again, just going to use an s orbital not hybridized at all. You could also be asked, well, what kind of hybrid orbital is that lone pair in right there? And again, nitrogen is hybridized, and so he's going to put that lone pair in one of his sp3 hybrid orbitals as well. Okay. Move on to the next one here. So if we were asked about one of these lovely sigma bonds between carbon and hydrogen, the carbon being hybridized will use an sp2 hybrid orbital. And the hydrogen just gonna play and again use his s orbital. Now, things get interesting if we look at the carbon oxygen bonds because there's both a sigma bond as well as a pi bond. And if you had your choice on which one you wanted to be asked about, you should choose the pi bond every time. Because if it's a sigma bond, any orbitals can be involved and you have to figure out which ones. But if they say what orbitals are overlapping to form the pi bond, you're just like P and P, done. Same two every time. P orbital with a P orbital. Carbon's got a P orbital, oxygen's got a P orbital, and they're going to overlap side to side, not end to end. But it's just going to be P orbital overlapping with a P orbital every time for a pi bond. So that's like the preferred question. Now, if we look at the sigma bond, 
we'd have to say, okay, the carbon is definitely hybridized, so he's going to use one of his sp2 hybrids. The oxygen's also hybridized, and so he also will use a hybrid orbital, another sp2. And so in this case, to make the sigma bond between carbon and oxygen, it'd be an sp2 from carbon overlapping with an sp2 from oxygen. Cool. One more question we could ask is, what kind of orbital is either lone pair on oxygen in? And we have to say, oh, is oxygen hybridized? And yes, he is. He's sp2 hybridized. Then the lone pairs will both be in sp2 hybrid orbitals as well. Cool, and that's generally the way this works. Let's just look at one more example here. So if we look at that triple bond yet again, keep in mind that the first bond again is always a sigma. Any additional bonds past that are pi bonds. And again, if they said, what orbitals are overlapping to make either one of those pi bonds? P and P, done. But my question for you is what orbitals are overlapping to make that sigma bond? So in this case, we gotta look and say, wait, oh, carbon's sp hybridized, the nitrogen's sp hybridized, and they're both being hybridized. They're gonna use one of their hybrid orbitals to make that sigma bond. And so in this case, that's gonna be an sp hybrid with an sp hybrid from nitrogen as well. Those are the orbitals overlapping to make that particular sigma bond. And this is how it works. So you could be asked this in kind of any context. I'll just give you some random Lewis structure and either ask you what two orbitals are overlapping to create a bond, or maybe possibly less likely, but possibly what orbital is a lone pair of electrons residing in. Cool. Hopefully this makes a little more sense uh, than it did when you got it in Gen Chem. Uh, it's a place we often scrimp a little bit and students just often don't come away with quite as good of an understanding as they could.